um, uh, we appreciate you uh, presenting to us today uh, from Radar First on whether to notify or not. So thanks, Jared. Thank you, Ted. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm joining you today from Des Moines, Iowa, so the great Midwest. Uh, so hello. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was really excited when Ted invited uh, us to speak today. Um, at just the opportunity to speak to a security group. Um, I have a decade, a decade uh, background in cybersecurity. Uh, and for the last several years, I've worked in the privacy space. And the cross collaboration of privacy and security teams is more vital than ever. Uh, and it's good to understand how the other side of the aisle is, is working. Um, on these privacy incidents once security hands them off to privacy. And so I think it's really going to be a valuable session today for us to discuss this and um, just for all of you to, uh, if you don't already, uh, or hopefully add some additional uh, information to uh, your knowledge base um, of what consists uh, within these privacy incidents. Um, I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, clients and customers uh, every day. And it's really interesting to see where privacy sits uh, within each organization based off of uh, the industry uh, and how their specific organization is configured. So uh, it's sometimes privacy sits right under security and sometimes privacy stand alone. Uh, sometimes they sit under compliance or legal. Uh, so it's very interesting. Um, it's a very interesting space to work in, and uh, I've really enjoyed it. So anyway, I hope our session is valuable uh, to you today. So just, uh, again, a quick introduction. So I'm the a director at Radar First. We're a privacy incident response uh, software company based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, what we're trying to do is bring automation to the privacy incident response space. Apart from my role at Radar, um, I'm also one of the co-chairs for uh, the International Association of Privacy Professionals or the IPP. Uh, so the ISACA for privacy um, group. Um, and like Ted mentioned, uh, ISACA has been um, a great partner of Radar's uh, for uh, the last several years. We've been really excited to support them um, over the longevity of our relationship uh, for privacy incident response. Um, wanted to just quickly uh, highlight um, some key takeaways that I hope that you walk away from our session with today. And uh, these were obviously in the email invite um, where you registered, but uh, I want you to, all participants, um, to be able to understand a little bit more of what leads organizations to underreport data, privacy incidents, uh, overreport and a lot of the nuances that should be considered around privacy incidents. Uh, so again, I hope that those are some key takeaways for, for everyone um, that attends our session today. Um, our agenda, um, obviously I, we just did some uh, introductions, but I uh, want to real quickly jump through some definitions to level set uh, when I say privacy incidents, uh, what I mean. Uh, we want to talk about the operational phases and life cycle of these incidents. I uh, want to break down some data around privacy incidents, uh, have a discussion around over and over, uh, under and over reporting, and again, highlight some nuances that should be considered. And then hopefully we have uh, a sufficient time for uh, some Q&A that uh, Ted will help moderate. We'll also have three polling questions throughout the a conversation that um, Ted will execute. So when we get to those slides, um, make sure uh, you're able to respond to those as well. So just to level set, wanted to clarify some definitions. Um, so obviously uh, talking to a cybersecurity group, um, some of the lingo or terminology is slightly different for privacy. Uh, when I say breach to privacy, uh, it doesn't trigger PTSD. It may for uh, some of you when I say the word breach. Um, so just wanted to 
uh, again, clarify um, some, some of these terms. So NIST defines an event um, as any observable occurrence in a system or network. Um, a privacy incident involves the improper use or disclosure of regulated data. So PHI or PII. A notifiable breach occurs when um, a, that incident, that privacy incident is risk assessed and it's determined that notification is required as a result of that incident. Now, uh, obviously different than uh, a security incident, a privacy incident may be the result of um, some type of improper use by a third party uh, or a misdirected uh, email or a misdirected piece of mail or a prescription bag that was handed to the wrong patient. Um, so it can be operational in nature uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be the fact that there's a uh, bad actor uh, or some type of um, malicious software that is making an attack. Um, that privacy incident obviously could be from a variety uh, of different sources with, within and with uh, and outside of your uh, organization. So what contains or what, what's, uh, what components um, are significant within a privacy incident. So um, obviously uh, we're using this brain um, uh, picture here uh, because to notify or not to notify obviously uh, shows that there is a decision that needs to be made um, as a result of a privacy incident of whether or not that incident rises to the level of a notifiable breach. And so in an intelligent way, we're trying to solve of whether, whether or not this incident rises to that level. Um, so these are, the again, the different components of an incident. How many individuals were impacted? Uh, what region of the world were those affected individuals? Um, obviously, there are different laws that will apply um, to residents of different countries like PIPEDA in Canada and GDPR. Um, versus the US and, and we could go on and on. There's many di different data protection laws um, across the globe. Uh, what role did your organization play uh, in the incident is an important detail. Were you the covered entity? Were you the business associate? Were you a service provider? Were you playing a dual role? Um, or under GDPR, they, they uh, define the covered entity as the controller of data. What third party obligations apply to this incident? So do you have any contractual obligations that may not be regulatory in nature, um, but to a referral source or to a client under a contract um, that if an incident or a breach occurs that you have a responsibility to notify them as the result of this incident? And then what internal policies apply? This could, this could take into consideration ambiguities in the law it could take into consideration um, states or jurisdictions that don't have defined timelines of when notification needs to take place. Uh, this could be incidents that repeat themselves over and over again, and you've you know, templated um, some type of response to those incidents that occur um, uh, occasionally. And then what laws apply to this incident? So what state, federal, or international laws um, are applicable if you're a healthcare entity uh, HIPAA high tech, if you're a financial services company or an insurance company, uh, maybe the NAIC model laws apply or GLBA. Uh, so then what data elements were actually exposed uh, or disclosed? And then what, was the, what were the risk factors around that data? So for example, if this was a misdirected email, was the email encrypted or not? Um, if it was a misdirected uh, fax or letter, were you able to confirm that that letter uh, or fax was shredded and, and disposed of? And were you able to gather some type of uh, written estate att attestation uh, that that has been destroyed? Um, where or when did the incident occur? And then where within your uh, organization or business did the incident occur? Uh, what department, what business line? Uh, or again, this is where you need to source whether or not this was the result of a business associate relationship, a third party that actually breached the data. So there are lots of components of a privacy incident and all of these need to be documented. And with the proper documentation and remediation, 
uh, we're finding that uh, a lot of companies and organizations can lower that percentage of, of, of notifiable incidents uh, with these proper uh, remediation documentation resources in place. Um, obviously, there can be tens of thousands of iterations of potential outcomes uh, if just you know a couple of these answers are different um, underneath these uh, components. So anyway, just wanted to, to highlight our definitions and then what makes up a privacy incident, and what the privacy team is looking for uh, as a result of one of these incidents um, to set the stage for uh, our discussion. So let's talk about some of the, the phases in an incident life cycle. Um, so obviously the first phase is to identify. Uh, this identification process um, a lot of times is detected by um, the information security team or is reported by uh, an employee or potentially a third party uh, external source. But making sure that these incidents are making their way um, to uh, the privacy team for them to be able to do the documentation and investigative process uh, is paramount to wrapping your arms around the risk that resides uh, in these incidents. And then, and then once that incident's collected, obviously the clock starts. Um, and so uh, a holistic uh, strategic investigation uh, needs to take place as the result of this incident being reported. Um, that, and that needs to involve obviously the key stakeholders um, and being the ability to be able to capture the information that's needed to uh, move towards uh, the risk assessment. Once the uh, incident is identified and investigated, uh, you then would proceed with the risk assessment portion um, of this life cycle. And uh, obviously a, a clearly defined uh, uh, process needs to be established here um, for the type of information that uh, you as a company uh, collect and or uh, what regulators you're subject to uh, or what states are in scope um, to properly define uh, the risk assessment. Look at, the, look at the risk of harm that's specific to that jurisdiction um, and move towards a decision of whether or not that incident rises to that uh, risk threshold that would warrant some type of notification. Um, obviously, if some notification is required, uh, then whether it's notification letters to the affected individuals, uh, notice to the regulators, whether that's electronic or a letter, um, notification to clients, third party um, obligations, you know, all of that uh, has to be uh, completed and documented. Um, and then a record of that, the fact that that notice has taken place obviously needs to be, be made. And then in a world where we are constantly striving to make decisions through uh, data-driven models, obviously the ability to analyze uh, and properly assess your program uh, on an ongoing basis from a, from a trend analysis perspective you know, is, is vital to be able to, 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 to determine you know, how long is it taking for us to move through these stages of the process how many incidents can we attribute to certain business associates? You know, all of these um, are important questions um, to be able to answer. So things that uh, we would, you know, point out uh, to, to consider ahead of time. Who's responsible? Uh, so what key stakeholders uh, play a role in this risk assessment process? and who ultimately is going to own the decision of whether or not notification uh, is going to be required or not. Um, so obviously, just like you would do tabletop, tabletop exercises uh, for cyber attacks, um, you having a, a plan uh, and a, a decision matrix around these privacy incidents is, is, is vital and, and very important. Um, Again, having a documented and defined uh, a process uh, ensures consistency, objectivity, and defensibility. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about those pillars and how vital they are to managing privacy incidents uh, a little bit later on. Um, but just consistency in this process uh, from a documentation standpoint 
uh, is really important. Um, making sure you have the tools and resources um, to be able to operationalize the management of privacy incidents um, is vital. And then again, just uh, making sure that everyone has an understanding of who needs to be looped into when one of these incidents occurs and who within the organization is going to make the final decision of whether or not that incident uh, rises to the level of that notifiable breach. Um, again, obviously, uh, there are you know, low, medium, high incidents that uh, occur within your organization. So if, if a misdirected uh, piece of mail uh, is a low, then obviously a large scale uh, cyber attack would you know, be a high. Um, the number of indi uh, affected individuals ob obviously is going to dictate how many folks and who you get involved in these incidents. But again, that's why it's vital to, uh, to define these things uh, ahead of time. So I, I uh, just kind of hinted at the fact that this is where we were going. Um, but these are four pillars that your privacy incident response program really should be based off of. Um, the fact that you have a consistent process, that it's objective, that it's timely, and that it's defensible. So consistent, again, um, the fact that if an incident occurs today and an incident occurs three months from now, if it's the same incident, obviously you should respond in the same way. Um, that it's objective, that, um, that you're not having different outcomes of an incident based off of who within the organization is managing that incident. Uh, again, that you have that consistency and objectivity from a decision-making standpoint. Obviously, uh, time is very important. Uh, for HIPAA, you have 60 days of when uh, in notification needs to take place. Uh, and then for AGs, uh, for some state AGs, it's 30 days. For GDPR, you know, it's 72 hours. So, uh, time is of the essence. And so having a process that is automated in some form or fashion to be able to meet those notification obligations is vital, vital and defensible. Something that if a regulator was to come and look and ask that you're able to point to and say, you know, this is how and why we made this decision. Um, so these are, th these are definitely things to take into consideration as you uh, look towards your assessment process. So this is our first polling question. So Ted, I'll ask you to share this question with everyone. Does your organization have a standalone privacy incident response solution? So um, uh, for those of you not on the client, I will, uh, let me post it real quick out to the chat. But if you can reply to the poll on your screen, but for, uh, for those of you that are using a browser, um, I, I just put it out in chat so you can respond in chat if you if you're unable to respond through the Zoom panel if you're not using the Zoom client. So we'll give it just a about thirty more seconds, and then uh, looks like almost everybody's responded, and then I'll share the results. So this one's, so uh, Jared, what do you normally expect to see on this one for, as far as a percentage of people that say yes or no as to whether they have a standalone privacy incident response solution? So I think it kind of goes at what they define as a privacy incident response solution. So, right. um, you know, there are lots of organizations that have another system from a different department that they're reusing or um, privacy IR, um, but I would say at least half of organizations that we talk to um, are still on some type of uh, manual spreadsheet, SharePoint, uh, Excel uh, format. Right, and, and Jared, and I failed to mention this at the beginning, you do have a site where those that want to download your presentation from today can download it. Is that something you can throw out in chat real quick? Absolutely. So if you can do that, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll here. And um, that way anybody that has to drop off a little early or something uh, would still be able to have the link uh, to where to download your slides from. 
So, um, so here's the result. So 53% uh, said that they do have a standalone privacy incident response solution. 47 do not. And that's out of 112 responses. So, uh, so pretty much right down the middle, about half and half said they do, and half said they do not. So, and that again, this is that's pretty standard. Um, this is what we would expect to hear. Um, again, still half of half of the organizations are um, on some type of manual process. <clears throat> so that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm. Next, kind of want to break down some privacy incident data. Um, and Radar is the only uh, uh, privacy vendor who is collecting this data around uh, privacy incidents. And we actually provide some industry reports. And so I'm going to talk about what non-automated um, uh, companies are doing for privacy IR. Uh, versus some metadata that's anonymous and aggregated from our product um, that we can use as a comparison uh, uh, to the industry. Hopefully that provides some insight. So based on uh, looking at the last four years um, of reporting from Baker ha uh, Hossletter um, of their uh, incident lifecycle time periods, this is how many days that it's taking um, organizations without automation to respond to privacy incidents. So you'll see back in 2018, and we have these different sections, right? The detection, containment analysis, notification, um, that it's taking roughly uh, from discovery to notify uh, 66 days. Um, and you'll see that there, uh, it's increasingly getting more difficult. Um, and this is because of the uh, rise in the number of incidents. This is the complexity. This is uh, the complexity of the laws um, that are in scope. You, you, you'll see that it's, it's not getting faster. It's actually um, adding days to the process um, over the last couple of years. Um, again, just because of the com complexity. So this is based off of just the industry report without automation. So looking at our metadata, um, we're able to look at some specific uh, industries, healthcare, finance, and insurance that have the most PII or PHI. And then we lump everyone else kind of that are outside of one of those three categories into a different tier. But if we look at the notification timeline with automation, we're seeing that companies are, are making decisions within 27 days from occurrence to providing notification. Um, so obviously automation helps hit these timelines. Kind of going back here, you know, if you look at 66 days from discovery to notify, obviously that's a violation of almost every major data breach law. So if you wanna argue that there are uh, states that say as expedient as possible or without unreasonable delay of notification taking place, uh, I guess you could argue that 66 days is fits in that category. Um, but under HIPAA, it's 60 days. Under most state AGs, it's 30 days. Most company policies, you know, it's two weeks to 30 days. Um, GDPR is 72 hours. So obviously you are way out of uh, compliance with these laws um, without automation. And, um, you know, again, it's still a lengthy process at 27 days with automation. Um, so just wanted to highlight some, some differences there. Um, also wanted to discuss just, you know, how many incidents are occurring uh, in these different categories? You know, what percentages of incidents um, are electronic, paper, verbal, visual, which are the three type of privacy incidents that um, occur. So unfortunately, we're still in a world of paper. So still 30% of incidents that are occurring um, are on paper. And so the, those are things that are mis still misdirected faxes, misdirected letters um, of sort. Um, but obviously the largest uh, cause or uh, uh, incident type today uh, is electronic. 
um, at just slightly over 64%. Uh, percent. And we, again, we have a breakdown um, here. Again, this is meta aggregated data uh, from our platform at looking at healthcare, financial, and insurance at what percentage of incidents that they're having. So uh, insurance is still having the largest uh, percentage of uh, paper incidents. Obviously, their EOBs are um, the cause uh, of that. Also wanted to look at um, a percentage of incidents that are occurring within organizations versus third party. Uh, this is something to really take uh, a hard look at uh, when assessing business associate agreements uh, or contracts is um, third parties are having the same percentage of incidents um, and, and breaches um, as companies uh, or businesses are um, that are being serviced by these third parties. And so understanding your third party risk uh, and the fact that if you're not consistently assessing, uh, okay, what third parties do I partner with? And um, there have obviously been some very public third party breaches recently uh, with solar winds and, and, and others uh, that have uh, uh, elevated this issue. Um, but this is something to definitely to, to continue to wrap your arms around the third party risk um, that exists as a result of uh, incidents that take place. Also wanted to share um, uh, the number of individuals that are typically affected um, in one of these incidents. So you'll see that uh, by category, um, you know, most incidents are involving one individual. Um, so you'd see, you'll, you'll see that here, um, that they're obviously the, the larger scale, the, the less we are seeing of those incidents occur. But the majority of those that are large scale are electronic. Um, but still, uh, the, the affected individual numbers um, follow a trend um, of electronic and paper uh, being the leading sources of these incidents occurring. Um, actually, a very few uh, number of incidents rise to the level of a notifiable breach. Um, but obviously, regardless of whether or not one individual is affected uh, or 10,000 plus, uh, you have to run this risk assessment, a documentation remediation process uh, on that incident regardless. Um, only 2%, I think this is a kind of an important stat to highlight, only 2% of privacy incidents are actually malicious in nature. Um, the, there are 5% uh, that are non-malicious and then uh, the other 92% uh, uh, or uh, uh, forgive me, 93% uh, um, are uh, unintentional. So errors, administrative employee errors are still the largest uh, result of most of these privacy incidents occurring. Um, so just kind of uh, an interesting fact to be able to note here. So this leads us to our second polling question. Um, so kind of talked a lot about how security and privacy teams work together. This is just a question to say, do privacy and security teams collaborate on a regular basis to manage incidents? So this is speaking to within your organization, your organization specifically, but do you feel like that the privacy and security teams work well together? Ted, I feel like we need some more of your Frank Sinatra or your uh, Ginger Rogers in the background. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, no kidding, right? So I've got the poll launched for this question and I'm also putting it out on chat right now uh, for anyone that's using a browser instead of the Zoom client, you can respond on chat and uh, to the question as well. So, so we'll give it again, just about 30 more seconds here. Y'all are being quick today or already well over a hundred respondents uh, out of the 129 people attending. So appreciate that. And um, thanks for, we have a large attendance today. So appreciate, uh, glad y'all could join. And evidently this is a topic that that uh, caused a lot of interest. So that's, that's good to see. 
so I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, in the poll here, and I'll share the results. So roughly 79% uh, regarding does the privacy and security team collaborate together on a regular basis to manage incidents? Um, so yes is 79%, no is 21%. Yeah. Uh, again, so not a not a huge shock. We you know we know that there are obviously some gaps uh, between the privacy and security teams, um, and but it is good to see that you know seventy nine percent of you do feel like you have uh, a good good working relationship to manage these incidents. Um, obviously, that collaboration is imperative to this process and to reducing the risk uh, to your organizations um, as it relates to these incidents. Um, so here we're going to move kind of into uh, some of the meat of our presentation um, uh, in discussion today around, you know, what leads organizations to over and under report. Um, I think there's a lot of valuable uh, information here. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand that unlike our judicial system, there's a presumption of breach. There's a presumption of guilt. Um, not a presumption of innocence. And it's your organization's responsibility to prove that the incident is not notifiable. Um, so there's an assumption that it, you are going to require notification. And then through your documentation uh, and remediation process, it's about getting that incident from 100% of required notification to a lower percentage. And so again, this is metadata, aggregated anonymous data from um, our solution. But this is looking at you know, what percentage of incidents actually rise to that level of uh, notifiable incidents uh, if the proper remediation and documentation is done. And so again, obviously 100% of these incidents have to be assessed. So if we look at you know, all uh, industries, uh, around 6.4% of incidents actually meet that threshold of a required notification. Uh, within healthcare, about 6.5% of incidents, privacy incidents, are going to rise to that uh, level. 4.34% uh, in finance, and the lowest is uh, insurance, 381 and again, a lot of this is, you know, if you can get some type of written at attestation that those paper incidents of those EOBs that are being sent out have been shredded, destroyed, or returned, um, you can, uh, again, reduce uh, the impact of providing uh, notice. So again, just wanting to highlight the importance of uh, proper risk mitigation as it uh, pertains to these privacy incidents and, um, uh, getting this number as low as possible, but again, still being in compliance. So um, the alternative obviously is over or under reporting um, and there's risks to both. So over reporting, obviously you are uh, damaging your brand and reputation. Uh, you're eroding confidence or you know, trust that you have uh, with your customers uh, or patients. You're going to be top of mind for regulators uh, and uh, potentially inviting them in for some type of lengthy investigation that uh, obviously is going to chew up resources. There's a, an operational cost to uh, providing notification, uh, providing credit monitoring, uh, sending letters out to the affected individuals um, or to the regulators. So there's a cost of, of over-reporting um, that's financial to your organization as well. And then obviously the risk to under-reporting, uh, some fines uh, from regulators, uh, the diminishing uh, confidence that your customers um, or patients will have um, in your uh, uh, organization. And that also uh, impacts uh, uh, just your reputation in the market. Um, if you have a state, for example, um, that has a loophole um, to not provide notification, 
but another state that calls you to uh, notify in the same incident. And some of your customers found out that because they were in a state that there was a loophole, you didn't provide notification, um, but you did where mandatory, um, that can impact how they view your uh, organization. And then obviously there's um, a lot of M&A, uh, mergers and acquisitions implications here. Uh, whoever uh, acquires your organization obviously inherits the risk associated um, with this methodology of underreporting, um, and it can lead to negative impacts. Um, we've actually started to see some fines for underreporting um, of the actual privacy officer. So not just of the organization uh, or company, but of the privacy officer themselves for not reporting an incident. So I um, wanted to highlight a couple, a couple more points here on the dangers of over-reporting. So obviously uh, trust is at the core of um, our relationships with you know, customers, patients, members, partners, consumers um, of why they do business uh, with us. And so um, eroding that trust um, is obviously very damaging to the bottom line, uh, into the business, into that relationship. Um, we've actually seen, um, based off of a report uh, uh, released by Accenture and their strategy research report, that in fact, 180 billion in revenue uh, was at stake across the 54% of companies in the analysis that experienced a drop in trust. So they're, again, highlighting the uh, uh, damage to the bottom line um, uh, when trust is eroded. And then obviously uh, the, uh, uh, the view from a regulator standpoint of you don't want their attention to be on you, your team, your organization. Um, this is a methodology that a lot of companies uh, took especially when GDPR was just to over notify, just to notify them on everything. Uh, so in the US, obviously you're inviting an investigation, um, but there actually are fines that uh, uh, EU companies are providing for over notifying. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an indication that you don't have an identified risk assessment process of an incident um, that you're just going ahead and reporting. Um, so again, 500 calls a week to its breach line. Um, the UK ICO uh, reported uh, just a, again, an indication that you don't have a process in place. Uh, and this strategy has been rejected by a lot of uh, EU regulators uh, where they are starting to find or launch investigations. Um, the, this overwhelm method um, to the regulators uh, is not a good strategy to, uh, to take. One highlighting again some of the additional risks of underreporting. Um, so you know I'm sure all of you uh, heard a couple of years ago of the the fine that was levied at uh, Uber for 148 million dollars, or Yahoo uh, for 35 million dollars. This is again large scale cybersecurity incidents that were not reported to the affected individuals and resulted in a large penalty. Uh, Amazon just had one of these um, under the EU, under GDPR, for $888 million um, just recently. Uh, so obviously, uh, the teeth of this legislation and of these fines um, is discouraging of underreporting. And then, uh, again, just the, the, the consumer confidence of you know, finding out that this incident occurred, not wanting to do business with your organization anymore um, because they don't, they don't feel like you properly cared for them as a consumer uh, post-incident uh, uh, by, by not notifying them or by trying to find a loophole of why you, do not, why you didn't need to notify them. This, so this leads us to our third and final um, notification or I mean a, a question, a polling question here, Ted. Um, does your organization take an approach that leads to over or under reporting? 
So again, this is anonymous, but we're just trying to get it, trying to get a feel for whether or not you feel like that your company uh, under or over reports what method, what what stance you, they, they, that you uh, that you take typically. Yeah, thanks, Jared. So I did place it out in uh, uh, in the chat um, in, in case you're not using the Zoom client, um, so you can respond to it in chat if you want. Um, and just a reminder, there is uh, no survey today. Uh, we're not really, uh, you know, for these live events, we don't need to do those. So, um, and we're really just doing the polls as more informational uh, purposes. So um, just to kind of share with, with our colleagues, you know, um, some of the feedback on where different organizations are. But, um, So I'll give you just a few more seconds. We've got more than 100 people that have responded to the poll. So if you want to respond to the poll, then uh, please do so. I'll give it about five more seconds. OK, and then I'll share the results. So again, almost split down the middle again, Jared, about 50 uh, four percent um, say it's under, and forty-six percent say over. So, um, so yeah. that one's pretty well split down the middle. Yeah, this is a, this is always an interesting stat to me, and I guess we could have provided a third option that said we properly overreport or we properly report. Um, but just kind of you know, you you you're, each organization, each company that we talk with has a different methodology of how they view these incidents. And it determines which direction, uh, which side that they go. Are they going to find the loopholes to under no notify? Um, or are they going to take the approach where they feel like uh, if there's any potential opportunity to notify, to, to notify uh, we, we're going to take that because we want to be transparent. So um, again, really, really valuable information there for everyone um, just to be able to store. Yeah, and somebody put in chat a just right option would have been a good option, probably a good thought. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. You, you'd have to be pretty confident to to feel uh, feel it's just right. But I'm sure maybe there are some organizations that have got it down. So yeah, good good point. And we'll highlight a little bit of that here in this upcoming section. Um, so what nuances around data privacy incidents should be considered? And so there's a lot of them. Um, so I'm not going to get to all of them and I'm not an attorney. <laughs> so, uh, but I, 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 I uh, have studied this a lot uh, for the last several years. Um, and I think that there's some important ones to, to point out. So um, these are maps um, of the, just the U S so not even looking at uh, nuances globally, but just U S based. Uh, and so You'll see on the on the left hand side, we're highlighting which states regulate electronic data versus electronic and paper. So I, I get maybe everyone knows, or maybe you don't know, um, that actually some states don't regulate paper, um, and it, it's actually you know more than you would think. On the right hand, you see which states require notice to the AG in which states don't. Um, and then there's other sections here that, you know, which states allow a risk of harm test uh, in which states don't, which states define medical information as PII in which states don't, which states require notification contents um, to require certain uh, pieces of information in which don't have specific requirements. And so just in the US, there's so much complexity um, from state to state on these data breach laws. And this is what I think is lost on a lot of people is the, complex, the complexity of, of these incidents, uh, regard, uh, depending on where the affected individuals are, will produce a very different outcome uh, per state. Uh, or some states you know, that are insurance companies or for insur our insurance companies that are in attendance, 
you know, have enacted these NAIC model laws. And some states haven't yet. Um, and even within insurance, these, these insurance state laws, there's variations of timeline of when notification needs to take place. Um, three days, three business days is different than 72 hours. And so there's all of these different uh, nuances within the laws in these different states that are obviously going to dictate um, a different requirement of notification based off of where the affected individuals are. So to highlight a couple of those um, state differences, I, I picked three states um, just to share with you. So this is out of our, out of our solution, um, but I just wanna highlight AG notification in a couple of states. So this is an incident that involved 500 uh, individuals did not require um, notification to the affected individuals or to the attorney general. But just to highlight some of the language that's specific to um, California. So I've got 500 individuals that were, were, are impacted and the law dictates here, if more than 500 California residents are affected, you are expect, expected to electronically submit a sample copy of the notification. So to the AG. So if I, have, if I have 500 people, it does not trigger uh, notice to the AG in California, but 501 does. So if more than 500 California residents are affected. But when I go to Florida, I've got 500 affected individuals, but notice the, how the language is different. Notice if 500 or more, so not if more than 500, if 500 or more. So 500 individuals triggers notification in Florida to the AG, whereas in 501 triggers notification in California. So again, just one example of the nuance of what triggers notification to an entity within a specific state versus not. You'll also see that I don't have any credit reporting agency notification requirement uh, in California but I do in Florida, but then that threshold is a thousand uh, affected individuals. So again, just a difference in the law between California and Florida as they regulate these notification uh, rate uh, 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 requirements. You'll also see that I have a due date here that's specified by Florida law and it's blank in California. That's because California says that you need to provide notification as expedient as possible, but they don't define it with a date, with a, the with a timeline of notification. Then let's compare that to Massachusetts. So uh, in Massachusetts, they also don't have a due date. They say as expedient as possible, um, but they, have, they don't have any uh, threshold for AG notification. So I have one individual affected in Massachusetts that would trigger notification to the AG because they don't have a threshold. And then they also have this entity that's specific to Massachusetts that only exists in Massachusetts called, called the Director of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulations that also doesn't have a threshold of uh, affected individuals to trigger notification that I also need to notify. So again, looking at three states, you know, just AG notification in California, it's 501. In Florida, it's 500 with a credit reporting agency of 1,000. In the Massachusetts, AG notification is triggered at one individual along with an entity that's specific to Massachusetts called the Director of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulations. Is accurate compliant reporting even possible? <laughs> so these are the things that obviously have to be true in order for accurate compliant reporting to be possible. Um, it has to be consistent. You need to have some type of automated process that weighs uh, data, data sensitivity. Uh, it has to be defensible. You have to have an updated uh, state, federal, international, or uh, industry regulations to ensure compliance. And it has to be a scalable process to be able to support an increase in the number of incidents. Uh, we see organizations are increasing uh, the number of incidents that they're uh, uh, consuming um, for privacy by 5% a year. Um, 
So this is this is typically so it, it, we highlighted in that salute uh, in that last polling question over under or uh, potentially providing we feel like it's adequate. Um, so Jared, Jared I, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm going to go ahead and relaunch it because I had a lot of people ask me to add that additional uh, couple of options. So I'm okay. going to go ahead and relaunch it just so we can see the different distribution. So sure. go, ahead, sure. go ahead and keep presenting, but I didn't want to confuse you when that new poll showed up. So um, that's so a great let me, idea. Let me that's launch that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so 7%. So if your if your notification percentage is somewhere between six and eight percent, right around seven percent, um, I would say that you're in that just right category. Um, so maybe you can use that as a indicator of you know are you over ten percent? You're probably over reporting. If you're you know well under five, um, you know around one or two percent, you're probably under reporting. Um, but we have found that that seven percent is the sweet spot uh, for most programs um, that are assessing, you know, some type of volume of incidents. Obviously, if you have a low number of privacy incidents, that, that data is going to be somewhat skewed. Yeah, great. And, and I want to thank Olivia, my friend from London, for, for uh, mentioning that to us. So appreciate that. As a good catch. So the, I'm going to go ahead and end it. Uh, I'll give you about five more seconds if you want to respond, because I know we're getting a little short on time. Um, uh, let me go ahead and end it here and go ahead and share it, because the results do change a lot when you add those other options in. So before it was kind of 50-50. Um, that's still kind of true for under over, but you can see uh, uh, the responses you know, 50-50 between under or over, but uh, by far 40% are saying just right, 33% saying not sure. Um, I, I think, you know, that's uh, probably, a, 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 all, all these are good answers. So 40% uh, think that they're, they're pretty accurate, 33% are, are not for sure. And then um, about 15% say they're under and 12% over. So, Thanks again uh, for the suggestions on chat to add those other options in there. I think that made it a lot more uh, properly reflective. Yeah, in the 33% not sure, that's the most interesting one to me uh, <laughs> because uh, it's really hard to wrap your arms around this data. You know, if you don't have an automated process, um, you know, to know which of these uh, is, or what, what your number is, um, it's really it's really difficult. So that, that's great. Yeah, and Jared, I, I know we're past the 50 minute mark. Uh, is there a way you can post that link for people to, if they want to be able to download the presentation, can you post that out to chat? I don't have it or I'd post it for you. Uh, yeah, I'm just working off of a single screen. So I uh, didn't want to go to the last page of the presentation without being there. So, um, if you want to uh, set up Q and A, I'll do that as we uh, as we start that process. Okay, yeah, no, I'll I'll get the Q and A ready. But go ahead and if you want to go ahead and jump there, and that way you can post it. That'd be great. So yeah, he's got several resources here um, on the website discover.radarfirst.com/isaka. So thanks for creating that. That way people not only have access to the presentation, but there's additional resources there if y'all want to uh, access those. Um, you know, I'm moving to where the presentations are actually, um, you know, the, the property of the presenters of not ISACA. So that's why we're trying to move towards where the presenters, uh, you know, uh, propagate the presentations and not us. So, and so each one of, yeah, absolutely. And each one of these is actually a link. So um, we have a video here, uh, a video here, and a guide how to fix an inconsistent manual and painful incident response process. And then obviously feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, that, that link that we did say discover.radar.com slash ISACA is a specific resource that'll take you through some pages that we 
uh, discussed today. So it's kind of curated specifically for you. Um, so hopefully that you, hopefully you find that valuable. So uh, I'm just going to leave this up um, instead of going back to the Q and A section. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead. That sounds good. I'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and jump into the Q and A. Um, so we did. You know, we've passed the 50 minute mark. If somebody has to drop, you'll still get your full CPE credit. So I want to thank you all for attending. But we're going to go ahead and jump into the. And Stephen, thanks for posting it out there on the chat for everybody. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go into the Q&A real quick um, and, uh, and uh, hit these. So, uh, so when we're, since we were talking about under over reporting, uh, Raymond's got a question uh, and his question is, so finding the middle ground to over under reporting is key. Is, is that accurate? Absolutely. And I think it speaks to the maturity of your process, you know? Um, so again, like we talked about that 7% is, is kind of a sweet spot for what we've seen for industry averages of automating the process enough to be able to, um, you know, not over or under report, having the right documentation remediation uh, uh, mechanisms in place to be able to, to, to have that number um, somewhere between five and 10%. Okay, great. And, um, and then uh, John's got a question. What's the percentage of, of firms who have a, a competent privacy industry, indus, a privacy, uh, let me refresh, let me redo it. What's the percentage of, a fir of firms who have a competent privacy incident policy process effectively in use? So what do you typically see there, Jerry? Uh, so it really depends on what business they're in. Um, so I would say that, you know, they're the large, the majority of uh, companies that collect PII or PHI, um, that they have some type of process in place, some type of leadership in place from a privacy standpoint. Um, they're massively underfunded and underprioritized. Um, but they are in place. And then obviously it's pretty, pretty disparate. You know, you might have a privacy resource or another resource within an organization that's playing a privacy role and, you know, is one of their many hats within an organization that's not collecting a lot of PII or PHI. Um, but uh, I think it's pretty, uh, matches our polling here that about, 50% of organizations that do have a lot of privacy incidents or do have privacy incidents because they have PII or PHI have an automated process in place. And half of them are still on some type of manual process, which is spreadsheets or they're using another department software that's not designed to manage privacy incidents. Um, and they're just trying to repurpose it to save cost. Okay, good. And let me get to the next question. Um, so, uh, for, you know, where in the organization does the data privacy role generally reside? So again, that that uh, it, it's a, that's a great question, and th that's one one of the things that I said on our opening is it's really dependent um, on each organization and company. There's not a set in stone, this is where privacy sits within our organization. Um, we see it under three different um, departments, uh, security, compliance, and legal. Again, that's based off of how the organization um, has created that function or has been managing that function up to this point. Um, there, is a, there is a designated team, but a lot of times they report up to either the CISO, the chief compliance officer, or the general counsel. Um, and uh, I'd love to see how many of you are working collaboratively with your privacy teams, but uh, in too many instances from what we see in the market, they're still working somewhat siloed from other departments. Right. And um, I did get some, uh, Someone on chat said they were having difficulty finding the presentation. So um, I will, I'll get a copy of it as well and, and post it. Um, 
uh, and send an email out to all the participants today uh, so you can find the presentation because I think a couple of people are having trouble finding it on the website. Okay. Uh, so I'll work on doing that. And, uh, and we are recording today and uh, it will be available for playback. Um, and uh, as far as your, um, we'll try to get that link to you by the you know, beginning of September when we send out the September monthly email and, um, and give us a, a, a couple of weeks uh, to get your CPE certificate sent to you as well. Uh, that's our normal rule of thumb, as y'all know. Uh, we try to get them out as soon as we can, but uh, we ask for a couple of weeks for to accommodate uh, people's vacations, et cetera, and, and other things going on. So, um, so with that, um, let me see. Uh, I think there's still, I know we have a couple more questions. Um, where can you find the organizational roles and their responsibilities for each role? Is there, is there a, a place you can find that, Jared, that's publicly available for an organization? So um, I would point folks to um, some of the resources on IPP.com. Um, so the International Association of Privacy Professionals would have um, some of those resources and diagrams. Um, you know, but obviously these are things that uh, each organization has to define for themselves based off of their own organizational structure of who's responsible for privacy. Um, but I, I would say that the IPP would be a good place to start. Um, they've got a lot of free resources on their website um, of, uh, of guides and uh, charts that would you know, help you be able to start templating some of that out. And whether it's that or whether it's you know, any conversation around your uh, privacy incident response process. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, I'm happy to help connect you to some of those resources as well. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to, I apologize, I'm going to have to end it. I have another meeting starting as well. And uh, I know we've lost a lot of the participants. I think they did as well. But we do have a few questions left. I'll work with Jared to get the answers to that. And like I said, I'll also send a link out to uh, the specific presentation from today as well as the recording uh, from today as well. But a big thank you to everybody. We had a great turnout today and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, Jared, thank you all for, uh, or thank you for participating today. We really appreciate you sharing your information with ISACA. Uh, I think it was very helpful and informative. And so we appreciate it. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, conclude today. But um, again, thanks, Jared. Any last comments you wanna say? Just thank you to everyone. It was a pleasure speaking with all of you today.